everyone. A uh, warm welcome back again to the Doctor Will See You Now. <laughs> uh, if you uh, if you are watching these in order and you watched the last interview that I did, um, I really feel that I should premise with this with, and now for something completely different. <laughs> and isn't that the wonder of, you know, crime writing and all the beautiful subgenre within? If last time we were gangland in uh, contemporary London, <laughs> uh, well, we're going back to Victorian times and we're going gothic. And yeah, <laughs> the gangs maybe disappeared, but the darkness <laughs> is Remain. dark as yeah, oh, it certainly does. And <laughs> for our time together in this session, I have with me an author who means an awful lot with regard to Newcastle Noir. She was one of the first authors that agreed to appear way back, <laughs> uh, almost 10 years ago now. I was a child. Uh, <laughs> Kate Griffin, it is beautiful to see you again. Thank um, you. Thank you. Lovely to see you too, Jackie. <laughs> yeah, that sense of just, you know, welcoming someone home or welcoming someone back. Um, you know, you've, you've, you've not seen a friend for ages and then you just pick up uh, where you left off. And, I, you know, I can say like we were talking before we started recording and it's just that thing of, ah, uh, how beautiful to, to just chat. Re yeah, <laughs> chat and re cement those links. It's great. Now, yeah. I have to ask you, because I've travelled to my parents in Wales, so I've not travelled with the book, but I wonder, do you have a copy? Because you have to, can you hold up a copy of the book? Well, fair enough, here's one I prepared earlier. Yes! <laughs> oh, look at that. Just look at that. Beautiful cover. Beautiful. Absolutely. And if you don't mind a little bit later on, I want to have a chat about that cover. Yeah. But honestly, it is, it is the, 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 the cover, readers, listeners, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> The cover is as stunning as the work inside, okay? Aww, it, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have to admit, I actually, when, when I first saw the cover, I shed a tear because mm. it is so beautiful and it was it's kind of everything. It's everything that I could possibly have wanted for that yeah. book to be. It's dark, but kind of kind of decadently beautiful. So. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I think, yeah, if you don't mind later, if we can pull that apart a little bit. Um, but but they, they have done you proud. Oh, they and, have. and I think it, you know, as I say, I think it is it is a beautiful, it's almost like the the door to a beautiful mansion. Well, creepy. Mansion, yeah, creepy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, which is fine shade, <laughs> which is fine shade, definitely. So, the eponymous fine shade and a Sunday Times historical fiction book of 2023, I and know. quite and quite rightly so. Come on, credit where it's due, quite rightly so. And so, it's billed as, and I love it, the witchy retelling of Henry James's The Turn of the Screw. And the turn of the screw is celebrating its 125th anniversary, apparently. Exactly. Yes, this yeah. year. This yeah. Year. It would have been in April, actually. But um, yeah, so he, he it was um, published um, in in instalments in Collier's magazine, which was an Edward, uh, well, Victorian literary magazine. But the first instalment came out in April 1898. So. Wow. Wow. And, and 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 we should say that you are published by Viper. Yes. I am. Yeah, I am. yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabulous. They're fabulous. Viper are an amazing publisher. They're... They they are without a doubt. And I think, you know, again, I know um, you know, those publishers that we, you know, the names that we get to know and we can think if if, if it's that publisher, it's gonna be a book worth getting hold of. And yeah. I think Viper is, you know, um yeah, yeah, That's they always, one. yeah, they offer, yeah, they offer the wonderful, creepy, dark, mysterious, yeah. And the books are very different. They're very, very different. They, um, Miranda Duess, the editor, yeah, is, um, she selects across all genres within the genre, exactly as she said. Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think they are all. Well, she always says that she likes books with a body in them. <laughs> <laughs> but they but you know that's such a broad remit really for a book so it, um, it it is and I really appreciate her shall we say nose or eye um for a yeah. For, yeah. For, for a for a novel that grips uh in whatever form it's gripping yeah. uh they, they certainly do now for anybody who's not familiar with you Kate um you have a background in English literature at university and I love on your bio it says you developed a healthy obsession with Victorian gothic novels oh 
Of course. Of course, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, anybody who does know you will know you for your fabulous Victorian Kitty Peck oh, series. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, and, and for anybody who doesn't, um, you have a whole beautiful range of books to, to yeah, just lose yourself in the past. Explore them. Yes, yeah. explore my back catalogue, please. Yeah, <laughs> on, honestly, uh, Kitty is a phenomenal character and, and all that she gets up to, yeah. Yeah, great, yeah. great reads. And they and funny enough, I think those books are quite gothic too. Not they, exactly. Quite serious. They um, you know, they're set in sort of the musicals of London in the 1880s. Mm. And some of the characters in them are very gothic. And I think that's kind of my happy place that I, I you know, I kind of always find myself returning to in some way or trying to sneak it in. So um so really fine shade was just me going full gothic. <laughs> <laughs> it's let me at it um, let me do it yeah yeah and you and you certainly did without a doubt but if if we can just like pop back to the start of of your writing and and ask you I mean it says it's healthy obsession and now you've been able to go full full gothic but what was it that initially drew you to write in in you know in the historical context um I I, my my happy place is history, so that's my comfort. okay. Yeah, um, I, I I suppose I do find the modern world a bit scary, actually, and a bit uncontrollable. Whereas mm. you know, if it's happened in the past, you feel it's kind of there. You know, it's kind of like it's there. You know about it. It's a known unknown, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, Whereas yeah. The present and the future are sort of unknown unknowns, and I find that quite. I am a creature of habit, and I do like to feel secure. Um, as you say, I did English literature at um, London University's Royal Holloway College. And if anyone who knows Royal Holloway College, it is the most gothic-y place. You know, it's, kind of like it's, a, it's a kind of like a mini castle out, out at Egham, which doesn't sound very sexy, but near Windsor. And it's full of turrets and pinnacles. Um, it was one of the first, uh, when I went there, it was a mixed college, but it was one of the first colleges in the country that was an all-woman's college. Um, and it's it was very much set up. You, you, we actually had rooms with fireplaces, and originally there were maids who looked after the people. Not in my time, obviously, <laughs> but there were maids who looked after people in each landing. Um, and the first room I had at Royal Holloway College was actually in one of the turrets. So I had a mm. room with a proper fireplace where we used to toast muffins. We all had our own rooms, so I used to toast muffins and kind of like yeah, crumpets and toast and stuff. Um, and I had a turret which had a little desk in. And it was, you know, it was, it was the dream, you know. It was, it, God, a room of one's I, own, yeah. It was a room of one's own, it was wonderful. It was my first time away from home and I really lucked out. You know, I came from Watford and there I was living in a castle with a turret of my own. Um, and doing English um, as as my degree, obviously, you know, it was. I loved reading books. I was yeah. quite a bookish, nerdy child. Uh -huh. I loved film, I loved books, I liked going to the theatre. They were, I wasn't very sporty, to be honest, um, but they were the things I adored. So for, for three years at university, reading big, fat books, not just Victorian ones, I mean, you know, kind of like cross, you know, we, we did plays, we did theatre. I really liked Victorian theatre, actually, as well. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I, as part of the things that we did, you know, I had to do the Brontes. And I say had to, you know, it was an absolute pleasure. Yeah. I'm sitting in my room, toast on my fire, <laughs> you know, reading Wuthering Heights or, yeah. you know, Jane Eyre. It's it's utterly perfect. So um, so I think I look back on that time with great fondness. Mm. And I look back on the books that I read at that time, many of which I'd read before I went to university, but kind of like you read them with a different You've eye. you a different, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you kind of like, you, you kind, it's like looking under the bonnet of a car. You know, you might admire a, a Ferrari when it goes past you in the street, but actually when you look under the bonnet, presume, I don't know about cars, but presumably you kind of like, if you know about that thing, you admire the beauty of that engine. So, yeah. And and that's what I did in those years at university. And, you know, they're very female books. They're, you know, they're wonderful. You know, the kind of the, the, the characters are great. They leap off the page. And also they leap into your senses. You know, they leap into your vision. When, when you read Jane Eyre, you know, you see um, that dreadful school she goes to. You, you, when she gets to um, Thorn, Thorn, Thornbridge, Thorn, 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 Thornfield Hall. When she gets to Thornfield Hall, you see it and you feel it, and you you can you see Mr. Rochester through her eyes, and you see Adele, her pupil, and you know it's kind of it's almost like you are living vicariously. Yes. Through yeah, and yeah. That, you know. And the same with Wuthering Heights too, which is I think even more deeply gothic actually, but also I think quite fantastically fantastical gothic. You know, it kind of like almost edges off into 
kind of like drug drug fueled <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 you know all the passion that in 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 Jane Eyre that that may be you know held simmering under yeah you know in, yes. in, in Wuthering Heights that passion is just it's just, just loose, yeah, yeah yeah just yeah. explodes yeah and I think you know the kind of I think they were a very interesting and possibly very strange family in that parsonage in Haworth, you know, with their father who was the vicar, mm -hmm. and that very intensity of all, all those kind of girls together. And also probably, you know, there was some sort of religious element to their life as well. Their father was the vicar. Yeah. So, you know, and yeah. they lived on the churchyard. I do remember my um, English teacher, and it really stuck in my mind when I was at school, saying that probably they were also ill because that, that their house was kind of in the churchyard and the and the kind of the, the, the water leaked rainwater leaked through the soil and it went through all those bodies in the churchyard many of whom had died of tuberculosis and it's why they would you know it's why they were such a sickly family but i mean what a strange febrile setting to grow up in yeah, yeah and yeah and the, the imagination that that released as you say, you know, it's it's wild. It's it's fascinating. And 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 you know, again, without gendering things too much, but just thinking of that idea of, and especially at the time, of giving voice. You know, we talk about giving voice to to women now, but back then, to give voice to women's, you know, passions, desires, dreams, yeah. hopes, thoughts. You know that you know, women as sentient thinking beings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, women as individuals. You yeah. know, not just like owned by their father or by their husband or by yeah. their brother. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Giving them, giving them relevance and giving mm. them a place. And, but you know, they even when they wrote their books, as you know, they they had to write under you know male pseudonyms. Ellis, Cara Acton Bell, you know, because yeah. people didn't take them, wouldn't have taken them seriously. Yeah. It was yeah. extraordinary that a woman should even think about writing a book, let alone writing one. You know, yeah, yeah. just yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Know your place. <laughs> yeah, precisely. Yeah. But you know what wonderful transgressive women they were, mm. really. Yeah. And you know, and what a path they've blazed for us all, not just, you know, in terms of what they achieve through their writing, but in their imagination. Yeah. And daring to have those imaginations, daring to put that down on paper, and then daring to publish it. It's extraordinary. Yeah, without a doubt. I would I would I would argue that that you are following wonderfully uh, in that tradition. And but I, then my next question that I've got, and, and uh, I don't know if I want to ask this because I'm not sure what the answer will be, um, but I have to. <laughs> okay, because because given given that you've you know this beautiful publication does does this mean the end of kitty peck are you done with kitty no i well i'm not faber and faber might be um but um so i was i was commissioned originally well as you know jackie the first kitty peck book was because i won the faber and faber and stylist magazine yeah petition to find a new female crime character and writer and I don't think I was what they wanted because I think they really wanted um, some domestic, contemporary domestic noir. <laughs> nah. and that wasn't what I wrote. As I told you earlier, it's not my happy place. Yeah. You know, I can't, yeah. not, you know, I can't do it. Um, I did try to. Funnily enough, when I wrote, when I sat down exactly ten years ago, you know, to 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 write that book, I kind of knew in my mind what they wanted. You know, I knew that they wanted kind of like a young police officer who probably had some family trouble, some interesting family challenges. But you know, had a, a unique kind of way of solving crimes. I can't. I couldn't write that. That's just not me. So I sat down and I wrote a chapter about kind of a, a rattled opium addicted crime baroness interviewing <laughs> a slop girl in a music hall, um, and heavily hinting that she'd murdered her brother. That, that the crime baroness had murdered her brother, and that became, you know, that's what happened. And they liked it. And you know, I, I, I kind of went for the interview at Faber and Faber, and they said, so you know, what? How much of this story have you written? And I said, well, you know, those 6,000 words for the contest. That's all. And I saw the look on their faces because I think they decided at that point that I was going to win, but they were like, horrified. <laughs> and then they said, well, can you write it by February? And I think this was October. And not having written a book before, I just said, oh, yeah, OK. Um, and, and I did. I wrote wow. it. And it, yeah. you know, it was, I just wrote, I was sat here where I am now. It's kind of like typed constantly. Um and I did do it in, I think it was 14 weeks, I wrote the book. Wow. Um, and they liked it. And then they, they commissioned a sequel to that. And then they commissioned two more. Um, but in that time, my editor at Faber, lovely editor, Hannah Griffiths, left to go to Pastures New. Um, and when you lose your editor, you lose your champion. 
Yeah, yeah. And that dynamic that's there in the bringing. I always think of editors a little bit like midwives, you know, yeah. like bringing, bringing yeah. a baby into the world, helping you, you do Absolutely. that. Yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, I, it was and for a bit, I was a bit untethered because I didn't have an editor. So the third book, um, I more or less edited myself because I was between there were changes at the company. Um, and then a lovely um, Libby Marshall, who is now a sort of a crime print editor in print, stepped in for the last book. But I knew by that time it was the last book because they mm. hadn't commissioned any more beyond yeah. before. Um, uh, but I left it. So I left it. I left Kitty Pet because I love her. I do actually love her. I love her as a character. Yeah. I love her kind of like wit and I love her kind of battling nature. And I love the fact that she tries to do the right thing, but often doesn't. Um, and, you know, kind of like her circumstances often get the better of her, but she's not all good. But she's not bad. Like, she's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. She's definitely not bad. Um, but where I left her at the end of book four, which was Kitty Peck and the Parliament of Shadows, I left her in a place where a big part of her story had been finished and explained. So her family, her strange family, um, how she came to be where she was, how Lady Ginger came to take an interest in her, all of that. Um, but I left the door open a little bit because in my mind, I think there's a future for Kitty, possibly on Her Majesty's Secret Service as a spy for Queen Victoria. So yes. that's my... Yes. Um, oh, uh, yes. That's that's where I would like her to go one day. One day. One day. That, that really pleases me. That pleases me <laughs> tremendously. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. But we'll, we'll just sit Kitty... On, on a little shelf over there for a minute what, <laughs> because to return to fine shade how how did you come by this project I mean like were you aware when you started with it that it would coincide with this anniversary or, or were you just merrily on, no, on a no, writing no. activity the weird that's the weirdest thing it was um the 125th anniversary it was just serendipity it just happened wow. um, so I just remember, and, and the idea came to me literally during I think it was the early days it wasn't actually no I wrote it I started it before lockdown I we, my husband and I go for a walk a lot and I was just walking around the, the lake in St Albans where I live with him one day um and there's a there's a secret at the heart of fine shade so I can't really say no you much. mustn't no I mustn't, I mustn't. <laughs> um but it's it's um it's inspired by the turn of the screw really I would say and I don't really want to say any more but I said to him um oh I've just had an idea what if X happened and then X happened and then you found out that X so that's that's all kind of very mysterious and and I said I have to write this I have to write this so the idea came from that character and I I, I genuinely just went away and wrote the first couple of lines and I couldn't stop Jackie I just wow. like I just and I, I didn't I'm not a planner I'm a pantser um but I knew this story from beginning to end I absolutely knew um what she did where she went what she was going to do and I just had to get it out of my head because I just and I just in the same way that Kitty is kind of like um is told from a first person narrative mm -hmm. and Kitty has quite a strong voice I think I hope anyway she does yeah but Marta has had an equally strong voice um and and I think she's kind of like the flip side of Kitty in lots of ways because as we say Kitty is good very she's a good if you kind of like well, I wouldn't want you to rip her apart but if you ripped her apart you'd find a heart of gold definitely if you ripped Marta apart you'd find something shriveled and black and terrifying mm -hmm. and they are like kind of two sides of a she was it was eerie she just kind of like she was frighteningly easy to write <laughs> Um, yeah, I, so we but we won't ask on on who she based. No, I, no it's fine. No, that, <laughs> I, that was I was just kidding. But I, I'm 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 brought back again, and and I've said this a number of times with authors previously. The fact that you on that walk with your husband, you start talking about these things, and it's before lockdown, and so these are. But the the book comes out at this time, so the notion that there are stories that need to be told. Hmm. And that you are the conduit for this one. And it wants yeah. to come out now. And maybe it wants to come out now because it wants to be told, but it also wants to be, you know, for people to be reminded of James's work and those connections and yeah. things. It's, yeah. 
yeah it's, it's very it's very um, I think I think we've had this conversation before but I'm I was very taken by hearing Ian Rankin speaking once about when an author sits down to begin a book he thinks there are like hundreds and hundreds of stories buzzing around in the air and when they find the receptive head they kind yeah. of leap on it and I kind of felt that that's what happened yeah. with this I do um and I wrote it and mo- the, the bulk of it was written um in the, the early stages of lockdown which was quite scary I think for everyone um and it sold I think it was three years ago but um there was such a kind of like a backlog in publishing um because yeah. of what had happened that Miranda uh, my editor at Viper just said well you know I'd love to buy it I really want this book and I really love that character she said, but I've you know how do you feel if it comes out in 2023 um, and I was quite excited, to be honest, because Viper had just kind of like started gathering a name and gaining a name. Mm-hmm. And, stuff. and I really wanted to be part of the Viper crew because you know, they had such a great reputation um, that I, you know, Frank, she doesn't know this, but I would have bitten her hand off, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, oh, yes, well, I think, oh, yes, that will be okay. <laughs> Whatever, yeah. Yes, please, yes, please. <laughs> So, yeah, brilliant that's... brilliant brilliant so um you mentioned your main protagonist there's a, there's a beautiful cast of characters in this and they use the word quite beautiful. tight quite a tight cast. yeah yeah very very much but you know that idea of you know we go into you know a, a claustrophobic setting mm-hmm. you know in that thing but let, let's let's if we can look at each one of them in turn a little bit mm-hmm. and we must start um with with Marta and I love how it's Marta not Martha we must remember well she she well right from the start she decides she's not going to be Martha yeah. You know, she is she, she's um she's kind of like she comes from a small village which I imagine to be somewhere in Lincolnshire or somewhere very uh-huh. flat, a very kind of like apart from this hill where the manor house is um and I, I think she thinks she's born for better things and Martha is a bit of a well she sees it as a bit of a drudgy name yeah. but her grandmother who is French and therefore suspicious obviously um has always called her Martha Martha yeah. Yeah. Um, so she decides when she arrives at Fine Shade and gets off the coach after being packed away to be a governess to get her out of the way of the local vicar's son, who she's been having a bit of an affair with. <laughs> so she's she, 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 she's out in the first five pages. She's out of Croyle. She's kind of they've got rid of her. Um, and the moment she gets out of the Fine Shade coach, the Pritchard's coach, she decides she's going to be somebody different. She reinvents herself at that moment as Martha. Mm. And, and I, you know, I wonder as well. Um, the, you know, we talked about the writing of the Brontes, and and f- you know, for you, in the creation of this character, what you've just told us about Martha, the, the her desire to reinvent herself. I mean, you know, we talk about Madonna and those reinventions of Madonna. You know that. It, um, it, do you think? Do you think it's possible for us to do that? And be successful. And do women? And do women? Do women do it better than men? I, I I don't often like to do this one side or the other, but I just wonder, you know, given that we have this strong female character. I think that's a really interesting question. I think women feel they should do it more than men because uh-huh. I think I think men often kind of like a a certain sort of man. Not all men, obviously, because that would be very reductive. But a certain sort of man is very confident about his place in the world and who he is and his achievements and where he's going. And particularly, I think, in the Victorian period, to be a man, you were already kind of like you'd already won one of the lottery tickets of life. Yes. Yeah. But um, so I think I think women feel the need to reinvent themselves if they want to go further. And certainly Marta wants to reinvent herself because she wants she feels that she was born to better things. She innately feels that she is not born to a kind of like a humble village life. I think there's something where she's at the funeral at the beginning. She can't believe they're all wearing dusty black clothes, their best clothes that are kept in the back of the wardrobes just for the funeral. And she said something, well, you know, I, I'd always wear my best clothes every day. It's exactly ridiculous. You know, she's kind of. Um... But, yeah, I think I don't know. I think I think women sometimes perhaps need to reinvent themselves to kind of do things that might be seen as transgressive or. Yeah. You know, because they're going against the female grain. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sort of, um, I don't know. They they it's almost like a mask. You know, they kind of put on a mask and become someone else to enable themselves. Yeah, to make that possible. 
to make yeah. it possible yeah, yeah so that they can act that out so um madonna's interesting because i mean she I, lo- I love madonna but you know she does take on so many different characters doesn't she and kind yeah. of like, and each you know it seems to me that every five years she reinvents herself as something different and partly that's a way of of trying to be relevant and struggling to be relevant yeah. but that's probably and also because she's getting a bit I'm not, I'm not older that's the wrong way to say but she's more mature now so yeah. she's still striving to be kind of like the queen of her career and at the center of her career and I think perhaps that's something that women also struggle with too that kind of like you know our value continues throughout our life yeah and I think again along along that that gender binary you know you mentioned about you know to be a man especially during the victorian era and and and, and definitely in a certain position you yeah. know it's like you're established and you but 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 that and, and that would remain whereas i think you know that idea there's so much linked to to, to women's physicality and yeah. and beauty that you know as things change you know how 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 it's valued um you know it seems to almost like to be going into invisibility so it yes. must rage against tremendously yes. um you know that again i don't think i don't think men again and we're talking about you know that's a very, very general, general very, term. Yeah, it, it, it yeah. is but that but that notion of not becoming invisible yeah not becoming invisible that's yeah. absolutely i think you know and i think that's at the heart of Marta because she you know she's kind of like um she comes from a fairly impoverished family in a small village and her fear is being invisible yeah you know she this when she goes to find shade um she sent there as a governess and it's a kind of a grand really grand old house in derbyshire very remote very isolated but for the first time in her life um i think she sees the possibility of a different life a very different life for herself um a not invisible life for herself um yeah. and I and yeah I think it's a it's a great temptation to her although she's <laughs> much tempting to be perfectly honest. I was gonna say um she's not the kind of you know not backward at coming forward and, and yeah. I wonder again you know the word ambition yeah and and how I think especially for those of us of a certain age um you know it it, it wasn't good to to be seen to what people called pushy yeah no, absolutely. you know um, not a feminine it's not a feminine trait is quite, it quite quite and speaking up is not a feminine trait exactly yeah. and you know and 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 so whilst you know there are certain parts of Martha's character that are not necessarily endearing <laughs> I think you know that single-mindedness that you know I, yeah. I know what I want and, and I'm going for it yeah. you know it, it, you know in the end you, you find yourself applauding this woman well you know it's so strange I know she's she's wicked you know somebody mm. said describe Martha in three words and I say wicked 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 because she mm-hmm. is a wicked character but i i know you know sort of not anecdotally and also through kind of looking at, i know you should never look at goodreads or amazon but i have you know to my to my shame um and i can see that people have found themselves rooting for her despite yeah. themselves and you know a lot of the i think i've shocked quite a lot of readers who obviously really want to empathize with the main character and you know kind of like really love the main character mm. and they're surprised how much they get behind Marta even though they can see that she's devious and bad and malicious and black-hearted but they really want her and I think it's that ambition and mm. and I think also it's it's allowing women you know you don't have to be the good girl you don't have to be the nurturing maternal figure mm. you know you can be ambitious you can kind of like strike out of the box you can be different mm. and and that's why I had a lot of fun with her, really. I, in some ways, Jackie, I wanted to sort of push to see how far great I yeah. make her go. Yeah. And I was quite surprised at how far I could make her go, actually. Oh, really? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you were talking there, the, the image that came to mind was uh, Angelina Jolie's Maleficent. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, that idea of a character that we really should be like, oh, mm-hmm. and yet and yet we're drawn to what is what is what is this magic about I you? Do, yeah, exactly. And it's partly, I think, part, but you know, there's a whole I think there's also um some sexism involved here because mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when you have male villains, you know, the male Bond villain, for example, or or Hannibal Lecter in the original books, you know, they just be, they just are oh, villains. Yes. You know, they're just yeah. kind of they grandstand amazingly and they make these incredibly complex, intelligent, quite sexy speeches. Um, and we don't ever have a kind of like a big complex investigation into their backstory to find out how they came to be that way we just accept 
you know, that they're born brilliantly bad. Yeah. Whereas it really annoys me in lots of fiction and in films that we have to, if there's a female bad character, even Maleficent is what reminded me, there has to be a reason why they went bad. Yeah, yes, you know, yeah, such a terrible thing in the past that, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that kind of warped yeah. her and, oh no, you know, this is why she went to the bad. No, Marcia was just born bad. You know, yeah. and it gets worse. That's uh, and I quite <laughs> enjoyed that. You know, and she is complex. Yes, you know, some terrible thing in the past doesn't necessarily make you more complex. What she, what it makes you, is vulnerable. And what Marta isn't, and which is what I really enjoyed, is she's not, never vulnerable. Not one moment is she vulnerable. But um, yeah, yeah, that sense of you know, like, like, like setting out in you know, new life, new place, scary place, and <laughs> she's yeah. yeah. Yeah, like, How am I going to make this work for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. can I get out of this? <laughs> yeah, I can, I can deal with this. Yeah. Now, now you mentioned, of course, that she has a French grandmother, and and that grandmother's death, you know, p- p- sets the wheels in motion for things. Yeah. But her grandmother also bequeaths a um, certain how shall we say gifts yes. can yeah. we talk about them like that would, yes. you, would you care to tell us a little bit about so, that gifting so Marcia's grandma is I suppose what you would have called a cunning woman mm-hmm. um, a village and, and I think she's she, she we, when we first meet her they're, they're going to a, a, an old woman's house um, and the grandmother is taking a tincture to ease her um, made of herbs and things um, there are kind of whispers in the village which is kind of obviously a very English village that you know there might be something not quite right about Grandmere partly because she's French and therefore, <laughs> and therefore um, but partly because you know she does deal in herbs and kind of and th- I think also you know there was always this tradition that um, women who the healing role was kind of huge in 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 village life and it was generally a woman who did that um the midwife for example yes you know, yeah. was, was the, the most crucial time in a person's life the midwife would be there so it's kind of magical as well they kind of almost have a power over life and i if, and i think if you kind of look back at the puritan era um just taking that you know one step per, further i think that's where we get that whole idea for the kind of like the you know rounding women up and kind of like charging them with witchcraft mm. because they were doing something they had a power yeah it's yeah. a power that wasn't a man's power and it was very suspicious um so yeah so martha's grandmother is i suppose to all intents and purposes what you might call a witch although in my head she's quite a benign witch really um and she has been kind of like she can see something of herself in Marta. And she's been kind of training her up in sort of her herbal skills and things, but she dies. And what she doesn't do is to transfer on the kind of like the the benign side. Marta sees her as powerful and takes her powers and believes in her powers, but they're dark powers. Mm. And that when when the grandmother's gone, I wanted the reader to get the impression that actually Marta's kind of like last connection with the conscience or her sense of kind of like using powers for goodness has gone. Yeah. And so, you know, and she and she's kind of sent out into the world unformed or unfinished. So she's in a way, there's kind of quite a sort of an adolescence to her that that when you're adolescent, that whole idea of like you don't care what you do. You know, you're kind of like Yeah, you, and not you, seeing the re- yeah. The world, but, yeah, but, not seeing the repercussions or or, or the cost. Yeah, or, the consequences or yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um yeah so that's that was kind of what I was interested in really and I think also although it's set I mean in, notionally in my head the book's set in about 1840 1845 um but and, and I suppose also we'd be thinking about well it's the time of the industrial revolution and change but in the countryside there were still cunning well, there were still cunning women in Norfolk cunning women and men actually in Norfolk yeah. until, you know the 1940s 1950s so it's not it's not something that's gone away. It's perhaps something that's gone underground a little bit. But at that time, there still would have been people who believed in country remedies and, and indeed witchcraft, which is what we're talking about, really. Indeed, yeah, yeah, those old ways. And and the I know we were, yeah, and we were we were talking, you know, before we started the recording, that you know, d- during lockdown uh, and and since then, you know. I, I, trends we could talk about literary trends but there seems to be and 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 they are glorious yeah you know b- books and, and i mean I'm, I'm thinking particularly in 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 the in what we would term crime fiction but with with those supernatural elements mm-hmm. you know those otherworldly elements the, the thin spaces 
you yeah. know, people's powers. And and I just wondered, you know, spirit of the age, what you know, why why are we why? Yeah. Why? I well, I think this, and we we touched on this briefly before we started recording. But and you're right; there have been some amazing books about about with, with witches as mm. as central characters. And I think this year there's a term that's come out, which is witchature. Oh, so, yes. um, which is a fabulous term. Love um, it. Yeah. And it is a great term. And there's there's been many books. And I think that these books were well, there there are lots of people say this is kind of like a howl of female anger and it's like women kind of like reclaiming their their place. Um and I, I get that. I see that these books are largely about women. Um and totally that's a very valid way of looking at it. But I also think, and this is what we were talking about, that during lockdown, when a lot of us started writing these books or completed these books. Or started embroidering these books it was a time of such weirdness and uncertainty I mean I've never lived through anything like that mm -hmm. I, mean, I think he, my father probably you know, who lived during the, the, the second world war it's probably the closest that I can get to that communal feeling of like unease and uncertainty and, yes um and I think a lot of us sort of channel we were, we were looking for answers and lots of my younger friends who I worked with at the time they they sort of were very interested they suddenly became quite interested in things like astrology or yes. reading, yeah yeah um, or casting the runes and I found that fascinating because you know, these were very rational some of them very scientific young women who were suddenly looking for answers in places that were beyond yeah in that kind of liminal space and I think that loss of control we all felt during, during, particularly during the early days of lockdown before the vaccine, I think whether we knew it or not, it spurred a lot of us to kind of like think about supernatural forces or forces beyond ourselves or you know, a natural way to try to impose order on the environment. And, and I think that's why we looked back to, to the old yeah. way and the old beliefs. And we were talking about sort of the Wiccan beliefs and the pagan beliefs, which a lot of them, um, not the dark ones, but they are, you know, they're beautiful and reassuring and they're about nature and about the rhythms of nature and about finding answers and calmness in nature. And that, I think, was quite seductive, possibly. Yeah. Subliminally, yeah. possibly. But yeah. yeah, so that's, yeah, that's my, that's my, one of my theories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. I wonder if we could... Um, I've got I've got two questions. I am aware of time, and I, and I don't want to take up lots and lots of your time. Um, I'm a terrible I, chatterer. I it's am great. No, it's lovely. It's wonderful, and and, <laughs> and it almost makes me feel I want to do a part two. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, but um, the space that you've created or the location, so fine shade. Now I know, and I don't know whether you still are, but I know that you've been involved with the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. Yes, that's right. So, yeah. I, so I wonder to what extent did the creation of Fine Shade in your mind and onto the page was it influenced by any of the buildings that oh, you might have visited or you know? Completely, it was. Yeah. I mean, I'm so, I was so lucky to work for it's, um, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, which is also SPAB. That's, um, <laughs> We all called it Spab. Um, and it's it was Britain's oldest conservation charity. And I was their head of um press, really, I suppose, or head of communications. Um, and through them I got to visit some absolutely incredible houses, really old houses. Yeah. Um, and you get taken behind the scenes uh, of these buildings. So you know, it wasn't and some of them belonged to the natural national trust, or they were owned by families, or they belonged to um, you know, English heritage or something like that. But the great thing about being in the business, as it were, was that you would go to places that weren't normally open to the public. <laughs> so I've kind of like been in passages that run behind panelled halls, you know, with a torch and things. I've been into priest holes that you had to kind of like literally slither, you know, down kind of like stone and wooden passages to get into. And then you would imagine these men and women, I think it was mo mostly men, but I think there were women as well, hiding there, you know, from terrified that they were going to be discovered. Um, and so I, I kind of, I threw all of that, that kind of wonderful first-hand knowledge into Fine Shade, which is a very old house in the wilds of Derbyshire. It's, um, it's quite well run. It's quite orderly, um, but it's been neglected for many, and there's reasons that it's been well, neglected. neglected. Yeah, and it's been, and the the people who live there are quite happy for it to be forgotten in many ways just you know status quo to continue um and yes I did based it I based it on places that I've been to but I there are some houses that I particularly based it on Haddon Hall 
in in Derbyshire, which um, is beautiful. It's a medieval, fine medieval manor house. And the, the theory is possibly that um, Charlotte Bronte based Haddon Hall on Thornfield Hall in Jane Eyre. Yeah. Um, and I, I know everyone thinks that Jane Eyre is kind of in Yorkshire, set in Yorkshire, and it is. But she was a she had a friend who was married to a vicar in Hathersage, and she often visited Derbyshire. Ah, yeah. And Thorn is a very common Derbyshire place name. Um, I said the other place I based it on was a place called Thornbridge Hall and Islam Hall. They're all remote Derbyshire, great Derbyshire mansions in kind of beautiful isolated valleys but the other house that I thought of and really saw in my mind when I was writing it um is a house called Gwydir in North Wales um and it, it, Gwydir is one of the most magical and special places I've ever been to um it's privately owned but it's open to the public um and it's run by a couple who kind of bought it as a kind of like a passion project and it was a wreck when they bought it about 30 years ago and gradually they've been trying to kind of like restore it to its former medieval glory um and that's you know if 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 you look at pictures of Gwydir and then you read Fine Shade you will see you will see. That. okay thank you so had a Gwydir and those yeah thank you so, yeah, because I always you know the two to be able to link things and see what where something's grown out of, I, I always find that so intriguing. You know, those yeah. those, those elements. You know, it's almost like a you know a wonderful stew of the ingredients that have got gone in, and then yeah, it's a patchwork of all of those yeah. places, but and also a patchwork of my my very privileged position of being able to explore those places as well yeah. in a way that perhaps as a normal visitor you can't. Yeah, so you take us there, which is yeah. which is lovely, which is lovely. Oh. Um. The dynamic between Martha and her her charge, Grace. Hmm. Um, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that, because it's not the easiest of dynamics. No, no, it's not. And and actually, that was quite a challenge to write, because um, to, to Martha is packed off to find shade to be a governess. She speaks French and she's quite well educated. So she imagines herself kind of like with a with a kind of a wonderful ward or kind of a wonderful child that she's going to impress everybody with by how wonderfully she kind of like teaches her to dance and things. Sadly, when she arrives, she discovers that Grace is a child with learning difficulties. Um, and she realizes almost immediately that, that this is a prison really, and that she's, she's not, she's a manipulator. She's not going to be able to manipulate Grace to do what she wants. And Grace, I was never specific about Grace's um, problem. Yeah. Because I think that's really up to the reader. But what I really wanted to be was kind of, um, I wanted to, to give Grace a kind of agency. Grace, Grace is very much her own person. And there are powerful people in that house. And Marta thinks that she's the most powerful. But as you know, having read it, that may not always be the kind of... So, so Grace, I wanted to to really be like a, a proper living child that you kind of cared for because the people in the house actually adore grace the women that mrs gurney and yeah, old Maggie, yeah the housekeeper yeah the housekeeper yeah. and the maid and they, they they adore grace and it's them you find out who've brought marta there to care for her because they want this child who they love so much to to have an opportunity in life um and so although kind of like Marta loathes her and is awful to her, I always wanted to make it quite clear that you are seeing Grace through Marta's eyes and not through the eyes of the women in the other house people. Yeah. of the other people. So yeah. it was kind of a tightrope because um, you, you do worry that if you kind of like um, bring a, a, a child with learning difficulties to the page, you have to be very sensitive to that. Yes. Yeah. So I fought quite hard to make sure that Grace not only had a big role in the book, but that also her role was, was kind of like genuine. Yeah. You know, it was kind of like, and she, she kind of becomes the linchpin of the book. Although, you know, Marta. Well, let's say that Marta underestimates her at her yeah, peril. Which, which, yeah, which, yeah. which, which is wonderful. You know, again, I think this this idea of that we that we have characters in stories that you know that you know, the bring us you know people that we maybe don't normally see. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, yeah. and and understand. You know that that yeah the age well, again. I do, I do you think how often do you see a child with learning difficulties right at the centre of an action of the action? Exactly, exactly, and, and, and not just there as a cipher. Quite, know, she is a character who moves the plot. Yes, you know, yeah, kind of like, because there's more to Grace than 
any of us could possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, thank you for, for creating you know, both those characters. But for me, I think, you know, in particular, Grace, that, yeah, as you say, you know, if we're talking about agency and we're talking, you know, I, I, yeah. 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 I wonder if you would mind if I asked you the last question. It's not the last question on my list, but I I, I fear that we should make this. <laughs> oh, I'm the, sorry. <laughs> no, you, you you shouldn't apologize whatsoever. Um, as I say, I, I wish we could, you know, say, oh, shall we do part two? Um, but I, I mentioned the book cover before, and and on it, you know, there is that beautiful image of the magpie and the key. Yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. and uh, could you just talk to us about that image? Well, um, Marta is a kleptomaniac, so she has Marta has some very nasty little habits. <laughs> um, one of her nasty little habits it's about power. So I think witchcraft is about power. But the other thing that Marta does um, in terms of power is that she steals things from people to make herself feel better. So right from the start, we are aware she's got an aunt who they, they clearly have nothing in common, nothing at all. Um, she lives with her aunt, and she kind of like she's spiteful. She steals little things from her aunt and keeps them in a tin box in her bedroom, and she has a little box of trophies. Um, and there are some other quite grisly trophies, as you know, in that box, which link yeah. her to Nathaniel, her former lover, mm. uh, the vicar's son. Um, so a magpie is a bird that steals things. And also her grandmother's nickname for her is my little PA, my little pie. My little... So you, you get the impression that actually her grandmother had got Marta's measure and was like intending perhaps to kind of like, you know, steer her to a lighter path. But yes. um, but obviously she didn't get a chance to do so. Now the key um, is one of the objects that Marta steals when she goes to Fine Shade um, because the one, Fine Shade is actually a treasure house, although it's slightly forgotten. It's a very wealthy family, the Pritchards. And a, a, a Pritchard several centuries ago um, bought uh, his bride um, a mechanical, a marvelous mechanical monkey which he had made in India, which is studded with jewels. And the only way that they can sometimes control Grace, who can be a fractious child, is to wind up the mechanical monkey and let him perform. And he's quite a sinister thing, Panjandrum or Panjan the monkey, I think. But, but Grace adores him. And Marta, quite early on, realises that if she can control Grace, she can control a lot more. And the way to control grace is to have the key to Panjang. So that's why the the magpie on the cover. Yeah, I I have to, I have to say from a Newcastle Noir perspective, you know, it's like well the magpie uh, and that our wonderful football team that's done yes. so well. Yeah. yeah, I was thinking that you know with with the key to the you know to the champions. Oh my goodness. Um, but but that was just wishful thinking. Let's see what that what 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 next season brings. I'll send um, my witchy vibes to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, Kate, it is an absolute joy to spend time in conversation with you. Oh, even too. even if even if we just had a chat. But the fact that we've been able to, and we've oh, seriously, we've only scratched the surface. Of oh. the delicious darkness, the gothic joy that is fine shade. Oh, um, viewers, readers, listeners, um, I, I would even say, I, you know, I, I, I always like to try and tempt you to things. If if you were a fan of of, of the gothic, you'll be all over this. <laughs> but if you are a reader who may be uh, historical, may not up for me, go on. I dare you delve into these pages and tell me that you didn't enjoy it. Write oh, to me. Let me it's know. It's kind of psychological too, isn't it? Yeah, so exactly. It's not just a history. It's not, yeah. it's not a yeah. history lesson anyway. But no, no, yeah. not at all. It's simply that that is the setting. Um, uh, and because I, I, I was just thinking you, you know, to, to see this transposed, you know, into the present day, then it, it would be, it would be, you know, psychological sort of, it, yeah. it, it would. So, yeah, I think it would, yeah. Yeah, so, so I, th I think you get lots of different strands um, that can be enjoyed. Yeah. Oh, Kate, please keep writing, because it's oh, gorgeous what you do. Thank you, thank you so much. I really yeah. enjoyed, I, I mean, I, obviously I can chat for England, really, but, uh, well, for Great Britain, but, uh, but yeah, it's been a lovely chance to catch up and, yeah. and chat about fine shade. 
yeah and and please um please 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 let's let's try and get you back uh newcastle noir this year i'd love that I'd if we can delighted. do that i'd be beyond delighted so okay really would. newcastle noir was one of the first festivals i went to with the kitty pet books and it has a really important place in my heart because i had awesome. such a great time i'm so glad you did i'm so glad you did yeah so bye for now and, bye -bye. and yeah and let's chat again soon yeah yeah let's do it again soon yeah. okay Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.